your thoughts tonight? Uh, well, uh, I agree with you that it's pretty hopeless talking about what to do uh, with the French because uh, Priti Patel has uh, tried very hard to get an agreement with the French and has failed, and it's not, they're, not, they're not in the least bit likely to do anything. So we've got to focus on what we can do on our own. And I think what you just said is, is more or less pointing us in the right direction. Uh, essentially, the Australian policy is the right one. And when people refer to the Australian policy, they always uh, focus on the fact that there was offshore processing and how harsh that was. But actually, it had two prongs. One was to have a genuinely humane uh, asylum policy for people who uh, applied to come to the country legally in the first place. And they took uh, uh, around about 20 odd thousand people a year. Uh, and they were helped to get jobs and they helped with accommodation and they were introduced to people locally. And uh, on any measure, it was uh, not only humane, but generous. But at the same well, time, David, they were David, very strict about sorry, saying, David, if you come. Sorry, David, can so, I interrupt on that, on that specific point about the humane element yeah. of this? Because part of the problem here, it seems to me, is that if you have got the vim, the get up, the go, the energy to be one of the young men, predominantly young men on these boats, you may be precisely the sort of person who needs asylum uh, least. Because actually, if you go, and this has been proposed before, if you go to Pakistan, to one of the, to one of the massive refugee camps there, to process Afghan asylum seekers, you can separate the wheat from the chaff. You can work out in situ, in theatre, if you like, who is most deserving of a life in Britain. And the problem with this system, which this organic system that we have now, is that people make that decision themselves, don't we? And that means that young, fit men push their way to the head of the queue. Yeah, and most of the people who are coming uh, illegally are, are not um, <laughs> entitled to asylum. They are immigrants who are trying to come to a country they consider to be better. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I quite, I quite agree. But uh, what I think we need to do is to build uh, some accommodation centres here where people are detained if they arrive illegally. And, uh, of course, at the moment, you, you can be uh, detained for six months, imprisoned for six months for illegal entry. And under the Nationality and Borders Bill, there is a proposal to increase that to four years. Uh, I, I think it may be necessary to do something along those lines. But remember, the Australian offshore processing centres uh, apart from doing what you've just said, namely to uh, separate uh, the young, mainly young blokes who are, are just trying to get a better life from the genuine asylum seekers, uh, they were free to leave at any time. Uh, so it wasn't a prison. Uh, they couldn't come into Australia, but they could leave. They could go back. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I think you must have. You must have uh, that kind of centre. By the way, a lot of people in the existing uh, detention centres are free to leave at any time. I think about 20% of them say they do want to go back, but we don't really make that possible. But you might also, by the way, have to pay for their fares back, but then they at least have to own up to where they've actually come from. And uh, an arrangement would have to be made with their original home country or some other safe country um, David, but as things stand what you've got is uh, you know it's sanctimonious people well, portraying themselves as being truly humane and anybody who disagrees with them as being inhumane when in fact they are the ones who are creating the conditions that promote the gangsterism and that's and that's exactly my point that there's a political argument to be won here through the prism of the media which is saying look if, if you make it and it seems basic Logic, logic, doesn't it? If, if you say to people who are willing to risk this journey to come to this country, that if you come here, the situation you find yourself in will not be as it has been. You may be detained potentially for years, and at the end of that time, you will be repatriated or deported to the country of your origin because you've entered this country illegally. I mean, that just seems to stand to reason. And just on a humane level, the fewer people who want to make that journey, the more people deterred from doing so, the lower the death toll will be. Yeah, no, I quite agree. I think in, in, in religion, it used to be called the sin of pride, doesn't it? It used to be called, uh, you know, if you're a bit too self-satisfied about your own moral purity, when in fact, uh, in practice, you're doing a lot of harm. And I think a lot of people who are uh, claiming to be the humane ones in society are, in fact, harming uh, 
would-be asylum seekers and contributing to the system that leads to uh, the tragedies like the one that occurred yesterday. Uh, so the, the, the other problem we have here is we have this policy of dispersal, as it's called. And uh, you know, if you, once you, you've, you've landed on our shores, then you get parceled out between the local authorities, sometimes to hotels, sometimes to private accommodation, sometimes to social housing. And uh, that's a, quite an attractive deal because you get the, somewhere to live, you get a little bit of money and you get a mobile phone and, uh, and some support from the local council social workers. And uh, if, you've, if you've arrived legally, that's great. That's, that's the kind of people we should be. But if you've come illegally, we, they should be placed in accommodation centres and either uh, sent back or uh, allowed to go back yep. uh, if they apply for themselves that it's not David, <laughs> we've got to leave it there. David, 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 David Green okay. yes, we've got to leave it there but do appreciate your time thanks very much indeed for it well, we're joined also now from Paris by the Telegraph reporter David Shazan David thanks so much for joining us tonight how, how much coverage is this story getting in in the French media Huge. Uh, it's as big a story here now, following the deaths, the tragic deaths yesterday, as it is in the UK. Um, they are also reporting the souring of relations between France and Britain and the blame game that seems to be going on between French and British politicians. So uh, people are really looking at this now and wondering what's going on, because this is bad for everyone. Obviously, it's terrible for the migrants who died, those who risked their lives getting across the channel. Um, but it's bad for the UK. Uh, nearly 26,000 migrants have crossed the channel this year. Only five have been deported. Five. Um, but nevertheless, this creates a sort of bottleneck in the north of France, and it's very bad for Calais and the surrounding area because they really don't want all these migrants, either in camps or sleeping rough. And French police have to patrol the beaches. They get money from the UK. Fine. But uh, some people in France are beginning to ask questions about why the French are being paid to uh, essentially police the UK border, which is effectively on French soil rather than in Britain. David, we'd be very happy. I mean, there was a proposal, wasn't there, a few days ago for British officers to be on French soil, on French beaches, patrolling and deterring the people smugglers who are there. But obviously there are massive sovereignty issues around that. The optics for some people in France will be unacceptable. British police officers on French beaches. Yeah, and that's particularly difficult post-Brexit and with only a few months to go before uh, a presidential election. So just imagine if President Macron allows British police officers to patrol French beaches, the far-right parties and even the far-left parties will make huge political capital out of that. I really don't think it's going to happen. This is not a new suggestion. This is something that the British successive British governments have suggested over the past few years because this is a problem that goes back decades and the French have always rejected it on the grounds of national sovereignty and they also point out that the French coastline is extremely long so it doesn't matter how many officers you deploy you're still not going to succeed in preventing all the migrant crossings, particularly when many of them go to the beaches in the dead of night. So you'd need 24-hour surveillance. It would well, just David, take I've got to tell you, so many we, yeah, thousands um, of officers. Yeah, yeah, that may be true, but I've got to tell you, we were covering the situation on the Belarus-Polish border a fortnight ago, and the Polish there were using drones with night vision heat-seeking infrared cameras. So it, the technological wherewithal may be there, but we get your point. It's on a, on a big scale, given the length of coastline we're talking about. David. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.